All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Hopefully you had a great day yesterday, an even better day today. For the... <laughs> for those who went out to the remembrance ceremony, hopefully it wasn't too hot. I was uh, waiting outside. I saw a couple people coming off the bus. First thing, <laughs> oh, it was tough out there. So thanks for bearing through it. You, could, you had the option for the live stream, but we, we understand. So hopefully you had a good time outside out there <laughs> next year. That's right, next year. Um, I, I just want to say thanks for allowing us the opportunity on behalf of DPAA for you being here. I know we kept saying it, keep saying thank you, but we can't uh, say it enough and reemphasize that fact. So just thank you for allowing us this opportunity to be here with you, to be here for you and for us to all experience this together. Uh, for those of who I haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Mark Obwig. I'm the new uh, Director of Outreach and Communications here at DPAA. Uh, I've been here for about three months, and um, I say three months because at the end of this uh, event, you're gonna have a survey, so depending on what you say at the survey, maybe I'll say along. Maybe they'll let me stay longer than three months. We'll, we'll see. But uh, uh, just a little bit about me. Born and raised, Fort Ord, California. Uh, Army veteran, stationed in Korea. As a soldier, did some time there as a civilian. Uh, I was uh, uh, deployed to Iraq and also was in uh, Afghanistan as a civilian. So through all that, all throughout my little journey there, here at DPA, glad to be part of the family and glad to be here with all you families. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, before we get into uh, a rundown of the, today's agenda, uh, just a few admin notes. For those who haven't had the opportunity to provide a sample, or if you want to, AFDIL will be outside until about 4.30. Don't go rushing out yet, but uh, w when you get a chance, they, they will be there until 4.30. And one, one, more ad, one more note is that, unfortunately, we had a DPAA employee who was experiencing um, cold-like symptoms, so they tested, unfortunately, they tested positive uh, this morning, so they're, they're, they're in isolation right now. They are in, in good spirits, so that, that's a good thing, and they'll continue to be in the health and safety protocols. And we ask that you closely monitor your own safety and well-being. Wear a mask if that's something you want to do, and just a reminder that we have the glass room in this general direction where I'm pointing that's a stream, that is, uh, has our live stream up in case you feel more comfortable in that venue. And, and it can seat up to 32 people just in case you need that room. All right, I'm gonna go into the agenda, and if you want to follow along while I'm reading it, on page three, pages three and four are agenda for today. Uh, Gonna, right after I, I'm done speaking, we're going to go into our remembrance, remembrance ceremony, which you can reference on page 12 as a guide, but I'll go more into it once we start. But after that, we have a few recorded remarks from some of our invitees from the Republic of Korea and Department of State. Then we'll roll into uh, a special presentation by Dr. Don Berry about partner research projects, followed by Dr. Jung Woo Han, and he'll give a, a, a presentation uh, as well with uh, contributors for a panel type discussion. And after that, we will have a carryover session from yesterday in case you weren't able to ask a question. So we'll have time for that as well. Then after that, we'll hear from our director, Mr. McKegg, for some closing comments. Then we'll roll into a few other admin notes for tonight in case you're gonna to go to the Twilight, the Army Twilight Tattoo Ceremony. All right, does that all sound good? All right. <laughs> all right. We're gonna go into the remembrance ceremony. So if you wanna to go to page 12 of your program booklet as a guide, this is your opportunity to, <laughs> to um, tell us a little bit about your story as far as your, uh, your, your family member. And of course not mandatory, but if you wanna go ahead and share, we have service members posi position throughout the room. If you wanna go ahead and raise your hand, they, you can see them, they're, they're in uniform. They will have mics in hand, ready for you to share your story. Would anyone like to help us get started? All right, Sergeant Major. Hello, my name is Marietta Jessup, and I'm coming from St. Louis, Missouri. Please, guys, pray for us in St. Louis, please. And I'm on here. Hello, I'm sorry. My name is Marietta Jessup, and I'm coming from St. Louis, Missouri. Pray for us, please. And I'm here on behalf of my uncle, Corporal Charlie Frazier, uh, Jr. In this, in this process, I was going along, my mom was coming with me, and because she wanted to find her brother and find out 
like information about her brother. This is my first time here. And I've been searching and trying to find answers to my uncle's disappearance, her, he went missing in action. This has been an ongoing thing for like five or six years. But my uncle has been missing for 70, almost 70 years he's been missing. And we had no information, we had no correspondence from the military all those years. So I started investigating about six or seven years ago about my Uncle Charlie. And I found out how I can get in touch with certain people and how I can get information. And then I got a letter telling me about this meeting. My mom, me and my mom, we started trying to get ready and everything for the meeting, this right here. But my mom died. She died last August. Un, you know, she died of, uh, of uh, cancer. And she wanted to be here with me. And I just, I'm so excited about being here and I'm just so amazed about the wonderful things that's happened. And I got something to take back to my family because we always wanted answers. And I, I, I we have them now. And thank you guys. Thank you, ma'am. Would anyone else like to share? Oh, we have our hand raised in the back. Hello, I'm um, Ruth Tucker from California. I lost my brother. Um, he was, he's been missing since he was 18, and it's been 72 years now. And you know, I just want closure. Um, I wanted to tell you that my brother went in the army and he was at Fort Ord. And you know, way back in the 50s, he would hitchhike home. We lived near Sacramento. He would hitchhike home to save money to give my mom money to help with the big family we had. And at that time, he could hitchhike. And, that, and she would insist that he take the bus back to Fort Ord. And you know, you think about that, and he was a really good kid, just really had our family in, at, at heart. This is about the fifth or sixth time I've been to a briefing, and it's just wonderful what the Army has done to keep us informed about my brother. I appreciate all the work that everyone does. Thank you so much. My name is Tammy Shreve. Uh, my uncle Felix Yanez was 19 years old and he was killed in action within the first two weeks of the war. Um, I'm here today representing my family. My mom and his sister are his only two living relatives and they're both too fragile to travel. So I've been doing this for years and years and years, going to different seminars in different locations. One of the important things that I found to do is to get up and say your loved one's name, tell their story. Um, at one uh, meeting that we did in Phoenix, a lady heard, my, heard me tell the story, say his name. She came up to me and told me that her brother was my uncle's best friend and told me the story about how they were in the backyard playing guitar and she remembers clear as day that they dared each other to go join the military. So they ran down there, enlisted when they were 17 years old. Um, and it was just kind of a, a piece of the puzzle to fit together to learn the story that none of us ever knew the story. So it's important to get up, tell your story. I'm scared to death to speak in public. I'm up here shaking and telling all of you because it's important um, to do this. And good news is, a few days before my fiance and I came here, the military called and said that they found my uncle's remains. And I did not know. Definitely do that. 
that and always, there's hope. You know, you never know when it's going to happen. It's 72 years almost to the day that he was killed, that he was identified as. Thank you. It's so wonderful to see all of you here. This is amazing. And, this, and I know a lot of you, a lot of the families already have identified their loved ones, so they're not here. That's why we still got seats left. So, but you all look amazing, and those that are here for the first time, please come back. I wanted to tell you, yes, it's wonderful to tell your story, but also, there are going to be a lot of veterans in your town or in your area that need to tell their story too. Take them into the schools. I've done this eight times and I can guarantee you everybody that I took in there had an incredible, beautiful story. And uh, one in particular was a gentleman that was a Fulbright colonel and he was field promoted to a lieutenant to begin with and he was interrogated by Russia as a spy for eight months, during which time his son was born. I took this man in and he stood for eight hours while he was, had cancer, uh, leukemia and prostate cancer at the same time, doing his testimony to all these kids and their eyes were like bigger than this big. It was wonderful to watch and pass around his shadow boxes of medals. But if you do this, I guarantee you it not only reach those kids' lives, but it'll enrich your own. And then you can tell your story to these kids. And one teacher told me, she said, this is like having history with skin on. And it's a wonderful thing to do. Get involved with them. Don't go home and sit on your story. But, you know, share it and go to the news media I've been on twice and I get such really good field feedback. Caller Times is published three times. But it all you always come away with something new and trust me, it is a wonderful, important thing. And I know your father, your brother, your uncle, they're all they're gonna come home. And my brother's gonna come home too. Well, the story I had to tell is very similar to the one that this uh, woman told you earlier. My uh, uncle, James Allen Coleman, was killed in Korea, of course, many, probably 72 years ago or very close to it. And his family had been very serious about wanting him to be returned. And all that time. Uh, Dad gave uh, DNA in uh, 2014, uh, about a year before he died, uh, and his two brothers gave DNA, um, and they passed this uh, winter. But in May, we got word that he was identified. He also He also was in phase four of the punch bowl. He had been, uh, his remains had been removed from Korea in 1953 and listed at that time as uh, unidentified. And uh, the DNA samples made all the difference. My father was Captain Jim S. Trimble. He was in the Changchang River Valley when he was shot down by the Chinese. He told his troops to move. He took cover fire so that they could move. And I want to live long enough for him to come home.
cousin. Her, my aunt was very close to me, and my co cousin was an only child. She was the only, her, he was her only child. And when he disappeared, she said she was going to train me. And boy, she trained me from readings and readings and readings and everywhere else. And I've done it ever since I was a young girl. I've been to every meeting I could go to. And my prayer in my heart is that someday they find his body so I can take it home. Denise Barch and my father was Corporal Dun, um, Donald Dundor. Um, I asked my mother a couple of years back if he was drafted or if he enlisted. He enlisted because he wanted to go ahead and do his time, come home and take care of a fa family and own a gas station like his father. Um, he got married shortly before going over. Apparently during their honeymoon, they had a good time because a couple months later he found out he was going to be a father. But it, it was um, the last push for Pork Chop Hill at the end of the war, he went missing in action. So he never got to know whether he had a son or a daughter, and I never got to know my father. And this past year, my mother passed away. So this is kind of bittersweet because I would always go home after one of these and tell her everything. This year I can't do that. But I also realized Memorial Day, I have nobody else left in my life who can share the memories of my father to me. And it's, so I'm glad that some of you people got the chance to meet your loved ones, and the ones who haven't, I'm sure I hope you get the stories from your families. Um, and I'm so glad that this organization exists. I wish I had known about it years and years ago when my grandmother was still alive. I found out because my husband being in the service, we used to get these afterburners, and they had a little blurb in it, and that's how I got a hold of this organization. So if you know anybody, tell them to get a hold of this organization, no matter what war it is. My name is uh, Robert Johnston Moore. My father was Sergeant James Fred Johnston. My father joined the Army, uh, going to make a, a career when he was 16. The local pharmacist said he was 18. My grandmother was not happy about that at all, but there wasn't anything she could do about it. So anyway, he, uh, uh, in 1940, when he went into the Army, he fought all the way through World War II, fought on uh, Guadalcanal, uh, Saipan, Guam, Kenya, and uh, actually survived all of that, believe it or not. And, and then uh, went home for a while, married my mother. They had known each other since they were in elementary school. Married my mother, then they uh, went to Fort Benning, Georgia for training, for infantry training. Spent some time there, and uh, I think that's where I got started in the picture, from what I understand from my mother. And uh, after that, my father was shipped over to Japan. The war had started uh, shortly after that, and he went to, uh, uh, Korea and landed in Incheon. My wife and I are going to uh, Korea in September and we're going to land in Incheon and to be able to go there where my father first put, put his feet on the uh, Korean soil is going to be a special time. 72 years later, if you can imagine that. Anyway, my father fought with the uh, uh, South Korean soldiers. They went to uh, Seoul took that back with the Marine Corps, they took it back. Then he went all the way up to the Chosin Reservoir. And uh, he named me from a foxhole there, named me after my grandfather and after him. And uh, I'm a very proud son of his, and uh, the only child of his. And uh, 
He remains there today, I hope not, but I hope he's in one of those 55 boxes or at the punch bowl. So we're hopeful for that and looking forward to that. I know the rest of you are as well. But uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be able to go to the Library of Congress and share my father's story to have it permanently put into the archives of, of the uh, uh, Library of Congress. And you can do that too, by the way. That's a great way to keep the story alive. So anyway, thank you. Hello, I'm retired. My Sergeant Domingo Briones. I was with the military for a little bit, about 33 years. I am proud of my uncle. My, excuse me, yeah, my uncle. He was a Dalaido Mata Solis. He, he served in uh, Korea, became a MIA December the 1st, 1950. I went to Korea in 1995, but on a mission, and not the same kind of mission he had been there with. But still, at that point, I hadn't found out all the story that I have now. And I am proud to say that as a veteran, we always welcome people into our units, into our companies. And every time I come here, I ask people, are you here by yourself? And it's surprising how many people will say, yes, I'm here by myself. I don't have anybody here. But we have each other. We don't need to be alone. Introduce yourself, ask who you are, who's your family member, and together we can get through all of this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Polly Royer, and I'm here because of my father-in-law, Captain Ted Royer. Uh, he was shot down on the northern border so they have never recovered the plane or the crew members or anything. And potentially it's not looking good for any kind of an update. So we haven't been going to updates. Uh, but my husband was seven years old when this happened. His mother had a nervous breakdown. He never went through the death process and the emotional different uh, things. And I can tell you this story because he's asleep up in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I knew nothing about any of this because he was raised by his mother and his grandmother and they never disclosed any information. He never discussed any of this with me. He still doesn't discuss this with me, but I did find out when we were married for 30 years that when he was in high school, he played mind games with himself. He would put the baseball bat up on his shoulder and stand at home plate and tell himself, if I, if I hit a home run, my dad's coming home. So he has been messed up all these years. Thank goodness for the Air Force Department asked us several years ago when I said, can't we put a sign up on the highway on I-10 out of San Antonio, Texas that said in honor of Captain Ted Royer? And they said, well, have you ever had any kind of service? I said, no, no kind of funeral, no kind of memorial. She had a nervous breakdown, nothing ever happened. They set up an Arlington Memorial Service for us with a horse-drawn carriage and an Air Force band, and we had the, we have the, we still have the tombstone up there on the side of the hill. So I want to read to you and to tell you that it's very important for you to share the information that you have with your family with your children, with your grandchildren, because we might not be alive whenever they finally get these remains. I know they will someday, but uh, at this memorial service, my grandson, who is 10 years old now, this happened in 2019, and my son is named after his grandfather. He's a Ted Royer also. 
But my grandson read this at the service. I'm here because of you and things I never saw you do. My world is bright. I sleep safe at night. I'm here because of you. There are others next to me. I hope that you can see. They hold my hand and tell me I can be who I'm supposed to be. I'll learn to stand up tall, help others when they fall, and try to do all I can do. I'm here because of you. Uh, my name is Butch Morrow. My father was First Lieutenant Carl Nelson Morrow. He was uh, in the Army. Uh, he was in World War II, like the gentleman over there said. He, he lied about his age when he got in. And, and anyway, he, he served in World War II over in the European Theater. Came out with a, a few little odd and end medals and a few little odd and end scrapes and bumps and bruises, but he did make it out. But uh, he wanted the Army life. So he stayed in, uh, in the guards, and he was assigned to a guard unit over in Jackson, Tennessee. That's where I was born 75 years ago. And on my birthday the other day, my father's only remaining brother gave me a call on my birthday on July 3rd. Let me tell you a story that happened 75 years ago. Butch said, your dad comes pulling up in our driveway. We lived out in the country. Your dad comes pulling up in our driveway and he says, I want him, he, that's my uncle, and, and his sister, my dad's sister, to go to Jackson. We've got a new baby over there. He said, I need your help taking care of him. Well, that baby was me. So my cousin Tammy went over there and my Aunt Evelyn, Y'all, I've got Parkinson's, so forgive my shakes. But anyway, that's just part of it. But, but anyway, uh, he said he went to work with uh, Nelson a few times. And Nelson worked at an armory over there in Jackson uh, as second in command. And he said, I went to work with him a few times. He said he never would take me over to the actual armory, but he worked at the federal building in Jackson, Tennessee. Don't know if it's still there or not but it's the old federal building. Well, I have a son who's an attorney, he's a federal prosecutor, and guess where he works? At the federal building in Jackson, Tennessee, the same building that his granddad worked in. I said, now that's just a real neat thing to know, and it took 75 years for us to find out about that. But anyway, that's a little bit of my story. Hi, my name is Sally Hernandez. I'm here for my uncle, Sergeant Edward Drew Eaton. Um, my, my uncle, I've never met him. I never met my birth parents. I was adopted when I was seven years of age. Back in 1988, I decided I was gonna start searching for my birth family. Found them when I was 50, but I still never met my parents. I met my brothers and sisters. During my search, I found the name of Edward Andrew Eaton. He was born in 1931, February. He and my mother and all of her brothers and sisters were in St. Joseph's Orphanage in Little Rock, Arkansas, until they turned 18 years of age. As soon as they turned 18 years of age, they were kicked out of the orphanage and on their own. He immediately went and joined the Army he was deployed in July 1950, and he died in November of 1950. He never, ever had a life. None of my brothers or sisters, I am the oldest living member of our family, left. None of my brothers and sisters knew anything about my uncle. So I have, since 1988, tried to find information. Um, I think it was James Bolt from your organization contacted me 
uh, shortly after my 50th birthday. <laughs> and uh, so I have information on him. He died in North Korea after the Tiger March. Okay, so um, I have made it my mission since then, well, in the last 20 years, to try to introduce him to my brothers and sisters. And it would be a miracle, and God can do it. He can bring all of our family members home. And I wanted to thank the dedication of all of the servicemen here today and those that have, have died serving our country, keeping us alive. And um, I want to thank your organization for all that you have done to try to identify and bring home our loved ones. He died at the battles of John St. John because his, his group, the paratroopers that landed, were to stop the train that was carrying the most important high military for North Korea and also the prisoners of war, but probably many of your loved ones. That was on the 20th. They were executed that day, the day before when he would land on the 21st. And there, you know, the train was not stopped and the POWs were not saved. But we know that wars are fought to the death, and when they die, our soldiers are not forgotten. For as long as we love, love someone, or we know someone, or we love someone who loves someone, they will not be forgotten. I know that it's important to know that this war is not forgotten, and as we keep hearing here, that it's a remembered victory also. I do want to say that another point to someone made, to be sure and tell your story. I was here several years ago telling this about St. John, St. John, and about leaving Kempo Air Force, uh, uh, Air Base, when a man tapped me on the shoulder and said, I was there, 
And he began to tell me all about the rain that fell and how it got postponed and they didn't get to leave till about three o'clock because he was there doing the weights for the planes or making sure that they were the right, whatever they had to be that I never understand. And I realized then that Ed Adams breathed the same air my brother did the last hours that he had on earth. And this is it. You'll excuse me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention my own feeling that I think God is a good God. He takes care of all of us. And personally, uh, I sit here with mixed emotions, high and low, and some of the stories I hear because I was the 17-year-old. I was the one that went into Korea. I was in uh, in July, the latter part of July, I was in Okinawa in 1950. The war started in, Ju in July. Then when we, my brother and them first went in on July the 6th. They were the first groups in the 34th Division, and I was in Okinawa. I was not aware of the fact that he had been in, that they shipped him into uh, Korea. However, because of the need of our groups going in, for those of you who are not familiar with the history of why uh, uh, Korea stands out among a lot of the wars. When our people went in, whether you know it or not, they went in with a 45 pistol, a clip, a weapon, and another clip, and that was their protection. Those first 500 and some that was brought out of uh, Tokyo to stop the passage of the groups going south, the Koreans. He was the buffer zone. I was not aware exactly what his position was, but I do know in Okinawa, I was attached to what they call the 29th group, the airborne group, or airplanes. I was a loadmaster, so to speak. They needed help in Korea in getting supplies into them. A lot of people ask me, uh, what is the most memorial thing I can think about in uh, Korea? And uh, it's a sorrowful thing, but every morning I wake up, every night I go to bed. I think of the same thing. Uh, they dropped me into Kempo the first day we took it. It was the airport, the main airport, south of Seoul, and we needed that for the fighter planes coming in for regrouping and things like that. Well, that first day we went in, we were unloading, taking supplies up to the front. About four o'clock in the afternoon, we were notified all planes had to leave. There was going to be a, an attack on the Kempo field, which she was relating to at that particular time, where we dropped her brother out of so that all the planes had to be taken out. There was about 18 or 20 of us air, airmen there that were not attached to any of the groups, so we became infantry for, a, for that evening, and we were assigned to a, a, a foxhole. Now, this, the only reason I'm telling you, because you have to understand and feel like a, a vet that I appreciate what you're doing, and it makes life worthwhile to me. I was placed in the foxhole that night, about nine o'clock, we were told there was a group coming up to take the field to prepare for hand-to-hand -hand combat. About 10 minutes, we heard the group coming up the highway. I had my rifle ready to fire. A runner came down yelling, abort, abort, abort. That means to those who don't understand, forget it, drop to the ground, keep quiet, you don't mess with them, nothing. We let the group go through. Well, I didn't know at that time really what I had just witnessed and why. About a month later, I was guarding some prisoners in Kempo, and the uh, base, uh, base commander came by in a jeep. They loaded me in a plane, flew me out of Korea into Japan, and over the Japan waters, telling me that my brother had been captured. And, you know, that two siblings could not be in the same front at the same time. So at that time, they gave me a choice, and it seems the news media has picked up on this, but they asked me that I, if I wanted to go home, they said, you can go home or you can go back to what you were doing. And they asked me what I wanted to do, and I told them, well, I'm going back. And the captain, he said, why? I said, hell, it's the right thing to do. And uh, anyway, at that time, when they told me about all this, they also told me about my brother and then it came together. 
That group, you've heard of the death walk in Korea? When they first went in and hit that town, there's 500 some people with our military, they captured and killed half of them. Well, that, the North Koreans were dressed as civilians and guarding the prisoners, taking them on that death walk. That group that I came two minutes from firing on my own brother was that group was coming through. So to me, every time I hear some of you talk, I'm so thankful. And I want you to know on behalf of all the veterans, we appreciate what you're doing. You're wonderful, and thank you. My name is Carlos. <clears throat> I wanted to thank uh, Mr. William, Chuck Williams, uh, and Mike, and the new director of uh, the MIA POW office uh, for the United States Marine Corps. Our family is truly grateful for the hard work that they've done uh, on behalf of my family. My uncle was uh, Private First Class Thomas Montoya. Uh, when my uncle was listed as MIA, KIA, a couple of days later, he was with, uh, some of you remember Irene Mandra. My uncle was with her brother, Philip. Uh, and uh, we, my grandparents have been gone a long time. My mother, who was the closest to my uncle, has been gone for a long time. But we, our family, like you, carry on this effort to try to uh, hopefully one day bring him home. Unfortunately, the circumstances involving my uncle's death, uh, it's highly improbable that any remains will be recovered. Um, but it's good to be around people like yourselves, to hear your stories. And cause when I go back to Salt Lake, I share them with uh, the remaining aunts of uh, my uncle. Um, a side note, in Utah, it took me over 30 years to get the state of Utah to build uh, a World War II memorial monument. Utah's never had one. I was in the governor's office just before COVID hit, where he signed a bill. So now we have a committee coming together, and hopefully in the coming years we'll have one. Um, a couple of hours ago, I met a fellow brother of mine. Uh, I didn't get his name. I met him over here for a couple of minutes. Uh, and it made me feel very proud again talking with him. Um, he was with uh, Third Special Forces Group. I was with Seventh Special Forces Group. Uh, it was wonderful to talk with someone like that again. It's been a long time for me. He's uh, a great role model for many of us, like many of you in uniform are. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jack Witt. My uncle, Jack, who I'm named after, um, was in October 1952, his outpost was overrun, and one of the five men made it out, and he was one of the four that didn't. And as soon as the information got to my grandmother that my uncle was missing, my dad got the bright idea to enlist. And I say that out of respect. He went to Korea to find Uncle Jack. So you just have to know my father and the relationship we had. So I just looked him in the eye one day and I said, Dad, that's about the dumbest thing you ever did. <laughs> he said, but I couldn't leave him behind. And I said, I respect that. That's not the dumb part. I said, Korea is a large place. You, 
you're not just going to walk in like, to the bedroom and say, oh, he's over there. He said, it doesn't matter. I had to do it. So he did what he had to do, and, and I respected that. And he passed away in September of this past year, and his, word, his, love, his last words to me was, it's on you now. You have to take care of him when they bring him home. So the pressure is not on me, Chuck. It's on you guys. You got to go get him so I can keep my word to my father. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tracy Kramer. I'm from Peoria, Illinois. And my missing in action is my uncle, Wayne Franklin Elliott. Um, I'm here for my father. He's, it's his brother that's missing. Um, my dad was 14 years old. His brother was everything. My uncle was PFC and uh, 45th Infantry. I, as I listen to these stories, I'm struck by just the similarities. There are so many things at every single table. It's like, yes, that and that and that. I, too, am in a situation where it's highly unlikely. Um, G Company went out one night to show on to set up an ambush, and they were ambushed instead. Three hours of firefight later, and when everyone regrouped, my uncle was gone without a trace, as was one other gentleman. If there's anyone here from Albert Martin's family, I'd love to meet you. Um, but the two of them have literally disappeared into thin air with no sightings, no, they went back the next morning and canvassed the area and found nothing, no POW, reports of either one of them, anything at all. So I am just so thankful. This has torn my father up for years. Again, so many of the stories, what happened to their mother as a result of this happening, her refusal to have a service because she was still sending care packages for years because she refused to acknowledge that this could have possibly happened. And so my, now, my father had been doing the regional updates in the Midwest, and now he's just not in good health and able to do this, so it's on me. Um, and I am just so thankful for the community, for everyone's hard work, and I just can't say enough about the connections. Um, you never know where and how you're going to connect with people. In Peoria, Illinois, years ago, we started, uh, there was a group that started the Honor Flight, and we had the privilege of welcoming home the veterans from the very the inaugural honor flight in Peoria, and my girls made signs that my girl, that little girls made signs thanking them for their service, and we put the 45th insignia on the signs, and you just never know. At one, we've been to subsequent honor flight welcome home events after that, and at one point there was a gentleman at the other side of the airport that just was frantically grabbing his family members and shaking them and pointing at us and pointing at us. And when all was said and done, and he was very frail, they're helping him, and he's just like booking it over to us. It, that was his infantry. And we had no idea. And while he didn't, necessarily, didn't know my uncle, it's still the connection with that family, because when we saw MIA uh, honoring my uncle on the sign, all of his family members are just bawling and hanging on to him and realizing just across the airport and <laughs> walk away that that could have been them. And so get out there and tell the story. Thank you to everyone. I am here by myself, but I was adopted by Table 15, so thank you. <laughs> wanting to go to Korea and wanting to find out more. So I just can't thank everyone enough for all you do and all the opportunities. Thank you. My name is Mary Chittister Borovitz, and I'm here for my father, Colonel Arthur A. Chittister, who was lost in Chosen Reservoir in December 1950. 
And the, my story is a bit different than I've been hearing here today because my mom never spoke about him. And we paid, as young kids, I was seven years old, the oldest of four children. We really didn't spend a lot of time talking about him. We didn't have pictures of him. My mother remarried, and after that, there was definitely nothing going on about our dad. And I grew up being anti-military. I was angry. I could not understand why my father abandoned four children to go off and fight who knows where and who cares. That's how I felt for years, for decades. I spent a lot of time being really, really angry. I fought against the Vietnam War. And it's taken me a very long time to come back to some semblance of peace with this. And it happened because after my mom died, I got her address book and I sent out notices to all the people in her address book that she had died. And up comes a message from a person I now call Uncle Slim, Slim Russell. He had known my dad and he made his way out to visit us in California from Florida to tell stories to us I collected my brothers and sisters, who are all now adults, and we listened with tears to his stories about our dad and why he chose to go into the service. No one had ever told me he went in to take care of his family by being in the service and something he felt was important to do. I had never heard that, and it just really brought me up short. And I started thinking, I do things because I think it's important to do, and I believe in it, and he did too. Uh, let me jump forward to 2015. I was able to go to Korea with the first group of people. I want to highly recommend that program. And it was there also that I got such a huge picture of how much the South Koreans appreciated us. I. I had no way of knowing what difference it made to them, what difference it made in their lives, and I didn't have any way of knowing about that. Everywhere we went, there were banners hanging, thank you, thank you to your heroes, and banners on the buses, and a banner on our sheets in the bed at the hotels. I met a man in the grocery store who spoke English and came up and thanked us. My sister and I were there, and I went, this is like, this isn't uh, somebody who created this situation. This person just volunteered and came up. So I thought, I guess that really is the case. So when I think about this group, it has helped me to come to terms with why it is that he chose to be in the military. And having the ability to come to these meetings has really helped me a lot. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sue Bowden. I am here to honor my uncle, Danny, Air, Airman First Class, Danny Harris Pillsbury. I've been inspired by all of the stories that I've heard from all of you. I've been inspired by the dedication of the Korean War Memorial, uh, but I'm here to talk about an MIA from the truly forgotten war, and that's the Cold War. My uncle was 22 years old when he, um, boarded a flight with his uh, 11 other service members. He was in the Air Force, and um, they took off over the Sea of Japan. On June 13, 1952, his plane went down. My grandmother was told, he was the youngest of 12 kids, and like the other seven or other six brothers ahead of him, they'd all been in various branches of the military during World War II. So he felt it was important that he also serve his country by being in the military. My grandmother was told that he was on a weather reconnaissance flight and that his plane had gone down over the Sea of Japan. So for 20 years, that's what we all understood. Uh, but then in 1992, the gates opened, uh, allowing the United States to get more information about those servicemen or about those flights that went down. Uh, during the Cold War, and lo and behold, we found out that my uncle's plane was a 
reconnaissance plane, but it wasn't for the weather, it was a spy plane um, of, of Russia. And so the Russian two MiG fighter jets shot their plane down um, not that far from Russian land. Uh, we never knew really what happened to them. There were conflicting reports as to all of this, all the 12 flight crew were lost at sea. Um, and then there were other reports that there was wreckage seen and that there was a possibility that some of the, some of the flight crew had been taken prisoner. All my mother's life, she believed that my uncle lived after that crash and that he was someplace. And I know that when she died, she still felt that. But uh, I appreciate this, all of the work that the DPAA has done to um, honor not only the Korean War and the Cold War, but all of the other wars that have, have resulted in MIAs out there to help bring some closure to families. We'll probably never have closure, but I feel like it's my responsibility of that next generation, since all, all 12 of the Pillsbury clan are gone now, to um, continue to, to try to access information and to share that information with the rest of my family so that they can truly keep our hero, our family hero's spirit alive. Thank you. Before we get on to our next speaker, um, I just a quick admin note as far as our agenda. For the Cold War families, we have an optional breakout session, an open discussion with our Principal Deputy Director, Mrs. Fern Sumter Winbush, and Army Colonel John Lust, and Marine Colonel Matt Brannon, and they are in Studio A as an alpha. And for any Cold War families who would like to uh, go, in, go in the session, you can um, follow our Marine Captain Conrad Gansky, and he can show you to the room. Thank you. We'll go on to our next family member. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeff Cribben, and I'm here to honor father, my uncle, and actually my other uncle, uh, Robert. Uh, there were three 17-year-olds living in Coronado in San Diego in 1952 that decided they all wanted to enlist in the Marine Corps. Luckily, my mother's brother had better parental supervision, and he said, no, I'm not signing and letting you go into the Marines, but you can go into the Navy. So my uncle went into the Navy and ended up serving aboard the Manchester uh, for two years in country. My father and his identical twin brother uh, had no such luck. They were sent off to, uh, well, they ended up in the, the, what is now the DMZ, and they were assigned to Outpost Vegas. Uh, Outpost Vegas saw uh, a three-day battle, March 26, 1953, and though they wouldn't let my dad and his brother fight go on outpost together, they did serve together in the same unit. They had one serial number separated them. So while my father was back at the main line of resistance, uh, they would flip a coin. They were identical, so they would flip a coin to decide who had to do the bad duty, and if they had to change shirts to do it, that's what they would do. So one of these coin flips resulted in my uncle going out on outpost Vegas about 1,500 yards uh, beyond where my father was back at the MLR. At about 7 p.m., uh, 3,000 Chinese overran the outpost. My uncle was never seen again. So, getting involved in all of this, it really, it really injured my dad badly. And a lot of ups and downs over the years. And in 1969, he did have a nervous breakdown, and he was committed for two years, where they proceeded to give him 13 electroshock treatments, among other medications, and it just didn't go well. Um, so I got involved in trying to help out with the search and I found a lot of information by coming to these meetings and it's just a, a wonderful thing to do. Um, but I did want to mention uh, parts about my father's experience there. Uh, in, in, a, in an attempt to search for his brother, he moved forward into the, into the rice paddies where a mortar shell came in, landed in, and uh, he did receive some sh a shrapnel wound to the hand. So he was taken back to the aid station. Uh, it was later that day where he stopped a transport troop truck carrying dead Marines and decided that he would stop that transport troop, and he spent the next hour or two unzipping body bags looking for his brother. So... Anyway, uh, the part that I'd like to get to is that uh, 
About five years ago, I started an organization to try to build housing for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, so far, we've raised some good money and we've held golf tournaments and, and whatnot. And luckily, I live in San Diego, very close to Camp Pendleton. So our fundraising effort has kind of morphed into a, a twofold effort. And this year, we were able to host 52 active duty Marines from Camp Pendleton in our golf tournament, uh, where they get to come and enjoy a day of R&R &R surrounded by uh, civilians who really appreciate what they do. If you guys get a chance, please go to jimmyshouse.org and, and uh, you can see our mission and what we're trying to do uh, to make lives better for uh, others. Hi, my name is Megan Marks. I'm here for my mother, Jerry Angel, who passed away in 1999. Her first husband was Dwight Angel. He was an ensign in the Navy, and his plane went down on January 18, 1953, um, over the Straits of Formosa. Um, the other men on that plane included Ronald Dean, Clifford Byers, William McClure, Paul Morley, and Lloyd Smith, my friend Terry's grandpa. Um, to our knowledge, we're the only family here that represents the members of that crew. Um, that crew, unfortunately, was not honored on the wall of the members. Uh, we're fighting to get their names put on there, and I know that there are other people whose family members are not on that wall as well. Um, they died in service to their country, and we are eternally grateful for the support and the information that we get here that helps us to understand what happened. Um, and humbled to be with the rest of you in a similar way. My name is Elfina Tompkins Golden, and my father was Master Sergeant Reuben Tompkins. And I wanted to comment that lady's statement uh, about the way she felt about her father leaving and not knowing the reason. And I had that same feeling for many, many years, many years, I mean, most of my life. And what made me stop having that feeling was I had my father, the gentleman spoke about that yesterday. If you can, you can have a headstone placed at Arlington or your state uh, military. Uh, they, they won't, uh, if he, it's found, they won't let him have another funeral, but they will provide that in your state or at Arlington. And in 2015, I did that. I just figured I'm getting older, I'm an only child, so I might as well do it and have it done and know I can, re I can rest in peace. But um, I was very angry with my father for leaving me. I was seven years old. And he told me, I'll be back. And he never came back. So <laughs> I do this all the time. So I stay angry. In 2015, when I had him, the headstone placed in Arlington, I was invited to South Korea, so I was in South Korea in 2015 too, but I was privileged to go with uh, four civilians and all generals, these handsome generals went over, and we were able to go with them. And I think the lady is here, that was my, she's back there, she's one of the ladies, and it was a couple, and that was it. So we got to see what I needed to see to get closure. We needed to see it from a military point of view. We also got to see, I think they did too, the reenactment of the Korean War, where my father may have come in from Japan and all. So there is a way for some closure. I mean, when I came back after that, and meeting the people in Korea, and the way that they treated me, and the humility and the gratitude to us, Everything changed. I could forgive myself, my father, just everybody, the government, because they did not have a Korean War Memorial. And that is why I came. I didn't believe it. When they said it, I saw it online. Nope, they're not going to do it. They've been promising, you know. And it was there. 
and I am very grateful that that has occurred in my lifetime. My daughter is with me. She says, they're going to have it. I said, I don't know, you know. But um, I am very grateful to this organization. They have done a lot with me coming throughout the years, and I come quite often. Whatever I've asked them for, they got it. I have never asked them for anything that I did not get. I got the, the matter of fact, when we had the ceremony for my dad, I was the only one there. Nobody could get off work. So I had the intern, um, what do you call all the, I had the burial team, the airplanes, the rifles, everything, sitting there by myself. <laughs> And it was okay. And I was also told sometimes that even people that don't have family members that are as capable or able to come, that they will do the same ceremony for them too and tape it and send it to them. So if you're young, you knew at this, you're with a good group, just ask them. They're not going to fail you. It might take them a minute but they will not fail you. And I'm glad I know all of them and I appreciate them. Thank you. My name is Jerry Karpowitz. I'm named after my uncle whose plane was shot down on May 17th, 1953. We're all brothers and sisters here, so i just like to add to what my sister who just talked said, and my sister from San Antonio said about the memorial services. We had one for my uncle last, October, last August 6th at Arlington National Cemetery, and it was spectacular. We had, we had a flyover. The strangest thing about the flyover was that I was told that they shut down the Baltimore Airport, Reagan Airport, and Dulles so that they could do the flyover. Unbel unbelievable experience. Um, I, so I strongly suggest having a memorial, memorial service for your loved one because although they haven't found your loved one yet, when they do find your loved one, he'll have, he or she will have a place ready for him or her. And I'm very biased about this, but the Air Force, Casualty Office people, none of whom I see in here, I can't imagine that any other service has best people. I've, I've come to know these people over the number of years I've come to this event, and I think they're spectacular. And also, I hope everybody remembers it after Kelly McKeague talks, that you give him a standing ovation because I remember him saying last year about this memorial wall being done this year and it's done and I think he's a badass and I think he deserves a standing ovation after his speech with us. Thank you. It's good to see everybody here again. Good to you. He shipped out, and he told her, he said, 
I don't have a good feeling about this. I don't think I'll come home. 20, 21 days into his, his second, his, you know, his time in, in Korea, um, he was gone. He was missing in action. Um, there's, you know, he was uh, in, he was in the Battle of Taishan. Um, there's no record that he was ever a prisoner of war. There's no record that he was part of the Tiger March. Um, but his body has not been identified. So um, you know, I, I keep working and I keep hoping that um, he will one day, I uh, will get the phone call that he's been identified. I um, was able to get my, my aunt and her daughter uh, to give DNA samples and my two male cousins uh, to give DNA samples. I'm, I'm the one working on this, and I'm the only one who can't because of my relation, you know, because of where I stand in, in the family. But um, I hope that uh, one day we'll have the information to, to recognize Charlie. All my life, I grew up hearing stories the, the, with my dad and my other uncle and my aunt talking about him. And he was, um, he was declared missing in action on July 19th, 1950. I was born 13 months later. But I feel like I've known Charlie, just like I've known all my other uncles. And um, it, it just, it, it, it's such an honor to me that I'm, the, I'm able to, to work to try to get his story, you know, to find out what happened to him. And um, I've met so many nice people that in this in this organization coming to the, the annual meetings here, the regional meetings, I've met so many people. And to hear your stories, to share my story, um, means a lot. And uh, I just you know, I, I just hope and pray that one day we all have closure. Thank you. Thank you.